Dobar dan. Have you ever considered what it would be like to live in a world without stars? Because you see, before moving to Trieste three years ago, I spent 15 years in England. First at Oxford, in this picture, and then uh, in London, where the sky was often like the one that you see in this picture here, clouded. And it was quite depressing, to be honest, but I, not, I really didn't stop considering what uh, really the cloudy sky did, not just during the day, but at night. Until a few years ago, when I started uh, preparing for my inaugural lecture as a newly minted professor at Imperial College London, I looked back at my own path in life, and I realized how much the stars had actually done for me by being the inspiration for the scientific and professional life that led me to become a cosmologist, somebody who studies not the star, but the universe as a whole, to understand where it all came from and where it will all go and what it is all made of. And I realized that in a planet, on a planet perennially clouded over, full of clouds everywhere and at all times, people like me would not exist. My life would have been entirely different. And I started to wonder whether the same might not be true of humankind as a whole. And here today, I want to share with you some of the uh, revelations that I had by researching that question, because I became obsessed with this idea of a world without stars. What would have happened on a planet like that? And so I started thinking about all the different ways in which the stars have silently led humankind in many different ways. And one of the first ones that came to mind was, uh, of course, timekeeping, because all of uh, primordial calendars and timekeeping systems were based on lunar phases, the phases of the moon in the sky. And tracking the moon was very, very important early on uh, in the history of our species. And later on, the trajectory of the regular motion of the stars in the sky and the semi-regular motion of the planets in the sky gave rise to this idea of the clockwork universe. And timekeeping became mechanized, and clock, like the ones that we see here, uh, one of the oldest in existence, actually, in Padua, uh, the astronomical clock uh, of the Tower of Piazza del Capitanato in Padua, well, the, 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 those clocks became essentially a way of reproducing the mechanical motion of the spheres onto, onto, onto the Earth with techniques and instruments that then were very, very important later on when the scientific revolution came along. Navigation was another obvious idea, because uh, navigation, especially in the high seas, was crucially dependent on the stars, not just the North Star, Polaris, but also you know, the idea that you had to find out how to navigate east and west, the longitude problem, and that also the solution to that problem for a while dependent on, dependent on the stars. And all of the exploration and also the colonization and unfortunately the exploitation of far-flung lands dependent, dependent on stars for many, many centuries. Uh, and I discovered that while the Phoenicians' navigators had the coastlines of a Mediterranean Sea 2,000 years ago, well, at that time, Polynesian master navigators were already traversing 4,000 miles from Hawaii all the way to Tahiti, back and forth, regularly, navigating with no instruments, no charts, except you know, the knowledge of 3,000 stars in the sky and the knowledge of the natural world around them, the currents, the ocean, the clouds, the birds, the fish of the sea, and so on. And so I started to dig deeper, and another idea that came to mind is the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution that was kicked off by astronomy. We can symbolically start science at the moment when Galileo in 1610 uh, took the telescope that he had built for himself and did this revolutionary thing of looking up with it and opened up this vista of new discoveries, the moons of Jupiter, the craters of the moon, the phases of Venus. And all of that led then to the Copernican revolution and from there, physics. Newton as well, you know, the laws of gravitation that Newton uh, investigated, motivated by the motion of planets, by the motion of comets, and, uh, to understand the fact that an apple falls here on Earth just like the moon falls in its orbit around the Earth. All of that would not have existed without the stars. But today I want to tell you two other stories, two stories that were 
to me, rather unsuspected. And uh, I think uh, they really show how the stars have led our path in very hidden, unsuspected ways. And the connections that we sometimes forget about the stars are really, really deeply embedded, not just in our science and technology, but also in our psyche and the way we are in the world. And our story, our, the first story, takes us back all the way to 50,000 years ago. At the moment in prehistory, when humans were not the only kind of biped uh, uh, walking the Earth. In fact, at the moment in time when we, we were sharing the Earth with other kinds of humans, Neanderthals first among them, and if you go to places like the Natural History Museum in, in London, you will see uh, charts such as this one showing the evolution of humans from prehistory to today, and we place ourselves quite proudly at the top. The top skull is a skull of Homo sapiens. But is it really so? Is it really so clear, the fact that we are best, we survived, and all the other species, all the other kinds of humans didn't? And why is that? Also, the fact that you know, we, we carry 2 to 4 percent of uh, Neanderthal DNA inside our genes is testimony of the fact that things were not so clear-cut, that there was a period in our prehistory when we were sharing the Earth with another kind of human, the Neanderthals, and they were as good as us, or if not better, in many, many ways. And so the big mystery is, why are we here? to talk about the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals are just a pile of bones at the bottom of a cave and a little bit of DNA inside ourselves, and not the, way, the other way around. And I began to suspect that perhaps the stars had something to do with that as well. In fact, you know, the mystery of the disappearance of the Neanderthals 42, 43,000 years ago remains largely unsolved. The myth that we club them to death is just that. A myth. Because the fact is that the Neanderthals, you know, they were more strongly built than we are. They had, you know, the strength of uh, Olympic athletes. They had bigger bones. They, had, they were better adapted to cold climates of the north of Europe. They had 30 percent higher visual acuity than us. They had a bigger cranial capacity, even, and probably essentially the same cerebral functions as we do. They had fine motor skills, they were masters of fire, they even likely buried their dead. And so why are we here while they had three, four hundred thousand head start over us, you know, to, to create all of the inventions that made all the difference for Homo sapiens? There are many theories around, but whatever it is, it's certainly not a fact, you know, it wasn't strength, it wasn't brains, but perhaps it was the stars. And one of the things that we often overlook, because nowadays, of course, we don't look up anymore, we forget how crucial the moonlight can be on a dark night. Imagine you are a hunter-gatherer 50,000 years ago, and you're trying to uh, kill some big animal, some big prey, because that's where your nutritious meals come from. And if you stalk that prey at the end of the day, when light is fading and the conditions are cooler, this is now in the Africa savanna, perhaps, you know, there is no better day of doing it than when the moon is full, because when the moon is full, it rises when the sun sets. And that means that if you've wounded your prey and not quite killed it yet, you can stalk it into the night, because the moon will give you sufficient light to do that. You can read by the light of the full moon. And so really, keeping tabs on the phases of the moon and knowing when the moon would be full was a key uh, capability to ensure survival, because that, that, that is when the hunt was more likely to succeed. And if our species had been better at doing this than, say, the Neanderthals, that would have given them a crucial advantage. Not only that, but at the end of such a, a favorable and auspicious hunt, you might expect the, the tribe to congregate around this meal and to uh, celebrate this, 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 great, uh, this great food, essentially given to them by the moon, and perhaps engage in ritualistic feasts, perhaps even to coincide with women's peak fertility. Because the fact is, there is this synchronicity that remains largely unexplained to these days, the fact that the moon phases, the moon cycle lasts 29.5 days, which is almost exactly the same as a fertility cycle in, in, uh, in, in humans. 
uh, a coincidence which is unique among primates. And so women, prehistoric women, might have had another reason to keep track of the phases of the moon as a way of keeping track of their own cycle. And if that's so, then perhaps the first lunar calendars were crafted, were made by women, not just as a way of tracking the favorable times of the hunt, but also as a way of tracking their own uh, body clock, as it were. And we have evidence from 43,000 years ago in the form of a bone, such as the one that you see here, of a baboon, which is carved with 29 notches, which is very, very close to the exact period of the moon, 29.5. Could that be a first lunar calendar, the first evidence that indeed our ancestors did pay attention? And in fact, this bone is very, very smooth, has been touched for a long time, perhaps in darkness, feeling those notches with your bare hands as a way of counting the days. And if that is so, then prehistoric women might have been not just the first astronomers, but even perhaps the first mathematicians. But there is more to that, because you know, the availability of all sorts of natural resources, mushrooms, berries, fruits, uh, the migration of large game, that all sort of happened at specific times of the year, specific times which were heralded by the rising of certain type of stars and constellations and clusters uh, in the night sky. And so if Homo sapiens was actually able to predict the availability of food ahead of the Neanderthals by looking at the stars, by knowing that when the Pleiades, say, were rising, a certain type of egg would become soon available, well, that would have given them crucial advantage when the going got tough, when glacial swings in climate 43 or so a thousand years ago made the, uh, finding food even more crucial than it ever was. The Neanderthals never managed that. And there is another suggestion, the suggestion that our species was crucially good at something that we are doing even here today in this room, getting together and exchanging knowledge and exchanging ideas. And so if somebody invented something new, say uh, a sewing needle, that idea, that crucial idea that opened the door to creating nice garments that kept away cold and wind and snow and, and ice, that idea could spread through the tri various tribes and not be uh, limited to the inventor and die out when they died. But if that's true, then our species had to have some means of actually gathering, of getting together uh, different tribes, finding, the same, uh, finding themselves together at the same time in the same spot. And here, too, likely the stars were the key. Because, of course, you have to find your way, first of all. That's something that we can see also happening among uh, Uh, historical hunter-gatherers, like first people in Australia, which uh, for a very, very long time used the sky and, and star, what they call the dreaming tracks in the stars, not as a navigational aid, but as a mnemonic device, as something to remember the route by. And so they would look at the stars and sing a song that was uh, attached to the connection that they saw in the stars in the sky, and that song would tell them what path to take over hundreds of miles of, of pathless outback in Australia. And even today, where you are in Australia, on the right-hand side of this picture, you see the map here with the highway system of Australia. Well, the fact is that the first settlers, when they arrived to Australia, they started following the same path that the uh, first people of Australia had used for thousands of years. And the first highways were laid down along those very same tracks. And so it so turns out that when you're whizzing by in air-conditioned comfort today on an Australian highway, you're actually following, without knowing it, a track in the stars that prehistoric ancestors and, and, and Aboriginal people have laid down thousands of years ago. Not, not only an aid to finding your way then, but the stars, and the moon in particular, were very, very helpful in finding out when to meet. Because there's no point in getting to somewhere if nobody else is there. You have to set up in advance the time. And what better timekeeper than the full moon? And we see evidence for that, again, in Aboriginal Australian practices, in the form of message sticks, pieces of bark that uh, have been painted or carved, like the one that you see on the left-hand side of this picture, by showing, on the one side, the sender of the message, and the location of the sender is indicated by the, by the strips. Those are reverse crossings. And you see there is a little C shape in the bottom left of the left part of the bark. That's the indication of when the message was sent. 
at new moon. And then on the other side, you turn it, and it's a location of the meeting point, the where, by the river crossing, and the when, the full circle. That's the full moon. And so here we go. The stars gave us the path, and the moon gave us the when. And that's perhaps one of the ways in which our ancestors were so superior, so good at getting together, networking, talking about things, and exchanging ideas. And there is one final piece of evidence that when I discovered it, it sent shivers down my spine. If you go to Lascaux, the, uh, a, a, a very famous painted cave, prehistoric painted cave in, in the south of France, you will see an amazing uh, hall with, with depiction of bulls uh, all around the, the walls. Among them, one stands out in particular, this one that I've highlighted here, because it's accompanied by six dots. And the relative position, not only the number of dots, but the relative position of the dots with respect to the ball that you see here is reminiscent of something that we can still see in the sky, namely the Pleiades, the so-called Seven Sisters, which, as you can see, are nearby the constellation of Taurus, the bull, the constellation that has been uh, recognized for thousands of years by many, many civilizations, and the Pleiades themselves have been recognized by all civilizations in the history of humankind, because they're unmistakable. It's a group of six blue stars that shine not so brightly, but unmistakably in the night sky, because they're so close together, they look like jewels in the sky, and all the cultures in humankind have recognized them as special. But here's the thing. We call them, and everybody else calls them, the Seven Sisters, despite the fact that with the naked eye, you can only see six of them. Now, if you are exceptionally uh, good with your eyesight, and in really, really dark circumstances, you may see more. You, but some people will be able to see eight, some people 11, some people even 16. Indeed, the, the cluster, the open star cluster, contains hundreds of stars, too, too faint to be seen with the naked eye. But nobody ever sees seven. Galileo, with his telescope in, in 1610, when the first time he pointed it to the, to the Pleiades, saw 36 stars, for example. But so why do we call them the Seven Sisters, then? If, like uh, the Greek poet Aratus, already in the third century before Christ said, no, no star has perished in the memory of man, yet, so, yet we call them the Seven Sisters nevertheless. And what is even more strange to contemplate is that the same essential myth, the same idea of seven women, seven sisters, who have fled to the sky because they were chased by, in the Greek myth, by Orion, the big hunter, the powerful hunter, uh, the same essential idea can be found not just in Greek myth, it can be found, passed down by the generations, in the stories told by Australian aboriginals. They also see seven sisters in the sky, or so they say, and the legend is also about seven women that are, who are being chased by uh, a hunter, a big hunter, who wants to uh, rape them. And one of them disappears because of shame of having been caught by the hunter. And so, how is it possible? The Aboriginal Australian culture has had 40,000 years of separation from classical Greece, and yet the same story is told down the generations. Perhaps, just perhaps, there might be a hint of something going very deep back in time indeed. Indeed, going back all the way to before our ancestors left Africa to, to go to Greece, Europe, and then eventually reach Australia 60,000 years ago. Because astronomy tells us that today, two of the stars that make up the cluster, two of the brighter stars of the cluster, Pleione and Atlas, the two stars that you see in, on the left-hand side, in the corner of this picture, these two stars are today too close together to be distinguished with the naked eye. But because those stars move apart over time, 100,000 years ago, those stars were three times as further apart as they are today. Which means that 100,000 years ago, an average sighted sapiens looking at the seven sisters would have seen seven stars. Is it possible, then, that this legend, this myth, these stories, they go all the way back to the very beginning, and they are testimony of the fact that our prehistoric ancestors took good notice of the stars, took good notice of the night sky, because they knew that nothing else than their survival was at stake. 
And if they hadn't done so, perhaps we wouldn't be here to talk about it today. But now I want to fast forward to the present day. I want to leave prehistory and take us all the way to modernity. I will take a big jump over all the intervening millennia, all of which is, uh, is, is told in the book. But um, I want to take you to another place, another time, to tell you another story about the stars. And that story starts on March the 4th, 1837, in London. In fact, at the heart of London, in this beautiful mansion, and it's a Saturday night, and a young but already very well-traveled naturalist uh, walks up the stairs to this beautiful mansion in marie le bon because he's attending a, a, a very glitzy evening. In fact, he's going to one of the best parties in London. The name of the naturalist is none other than Charles Darwin, who's just returned from a round-the-world trip aboard the HMS Beagle, and he's thinking hard about what he has seen in far-flung lands and all the things that have sparked his interest in evolution and how did we get to be here and how, what, how can we explain the variety of the natural world all around us. Once inside the mansion, you know, lights ablaze and, and uh, the, the, the tables decked with all sorts of fantastic food, he is greeted by the host, this man, Charles Babbage. Charles Babbage, a mathematician who, in 1837, was holding the Lucasian chair of mathematics at Cambridge, the chair that had been Newton's. Uh, a man of great means, a man of great intelligence, but also a man with one singular obsession an obsession that would destroy his life, eat into his fortune, and eventually send him to his grave embittered and uh, uh, disappointed with himself. And, uh, and Babaji's obsession uh, started with his uh, interest, indeed with his obsession, in numerical tables. Now, this might seem odd to us, used as we are to computer power everywhere, but in Victorian England, if you were a banker, if you were an architect, if you were an accountant, if you were an astronomer, all of those uh, professions desperately needed uh, tabulated values of all sorts of functions, logarithmic functions, trigonometric functions, annuities, interest rates, all of which you could not just compute you know, by punching numbers into calculators because calculators did not exist. And so in Victorian England, uh, this, uh, the entire economic and indeed industrial society uh, was built around the availability of tables such as that, telling you the value of a logarithmic function tabulated over pages and pages and pages. And that was all very well, except those tables had themselves been computed by hand, by human computers, and they were full of errors. And Babbage was absolutely obsessed by those tables, and indeed, uh, he had a collection of over 140 volumes, and he picked at random 40 among them, and he found 3,400 unknowledged errors. And who knows how many more errors were in there? And those errors were you know, crucial. Imagine steering a ship, you know, navigating the high seas, and, your, and the calculation of your position dependent, dependent on those numbers, and you get it wrong, and you're dead. And in fact, one day in 1820, Babbage was sat down with his good friend, uh, John Herschel, the astronomer, and they were looking through astronomical tables uh, that were used for navigation, and they were finding error upon error upon error. And at some point, Babbage exclaimed, by God, I wish those tables had been computed by steam. And he set off to make this a reality, to invent a mean to computing tables, not by hand, but by machine. And that was a revolutionary idea. And he set to work to what became known as the difference engine, and a contraption made of brass and steam and, and, and steel rod, a machine that would be able to compute things automatically, effectively a, a, a general purpose calculator. And he, he, he devoted his life to it, he devoted his means to it, and he was on the brink of success when he had a bitter fight with the engineer that was building the thing, and the whole project fell apart. But Babbage you know, didn't give up. In, in actual fact, he doubled down, and he abandoned the difference engine project in favor of an even more ambitious project. 
an ambitious project that indeed caught the interest of Ada Lovelace, the estranged daughter of Lord Byron. Ada Lovelace was a mathematician herself, a very gifted mathematician herself, and who worked closely with uh, Babbage, and she also became known as the first computer programmer in history because she wrote down an algorithm that, if fed to Babbage's machine, would have uh, given out a, a specific function. And so she was very, very uh, enthusiastic and very, very taken by what she called Babbage's thinking machine. Because Babbage's second project was this, never to be realized, the analytical engine was actually nothing else but a modern-day computer. It had a, a, a central processing unit, a CPU as we call it now. It had memory banks, it had input-output systems. It would have been transformative. And the analytical engine, just like the, um, the different engine that had preceded it, were born among the stars. They had been motivated by an astronomical problem that Babbage wanted to solve, and I'll tell you more about the eventual origin of this story in a minute, because indeed, the stars have, have, have another hidden hand in this business. Except for the fact that Babbage never succeeded. So this computer was never built. Imagine what would have happened if the British Empire in 1850, let's say, had had access to computer power as we understand it today, 100 years before actual computers were invented and built in 1940, 1950. Uh, and indeed, the uh, origin of uh, Babbage's idea goes all the way back to astronomy. And to this man, Pierre-Simon de Laplace, who during his lifetime was called the Newton of France, polymath, uh, mathematician, astronomer. He did an, an enormous amount of work for science. Among it, a new theory of probability and a new theory of how to handle uncertainty in measurements, in particular the one that were coming from measurements of the position of celestial bodies in the sky. Because by the early 19th century, astronomers had become so good and measuring things in the sky, that people trying to predict the position of planets and asteroids in the solar system, such as Laplace, you know, they could no longer put together Newtonian theory, which was exact, with the observations of uh, astronomers, which were, of course, uh, subject to a margin of error. So Laplace had to invent, together with Gauss, a new kind of mathematics, the mathematics of uncertainty, which we use still to this day and very much underpins many of the technologies and the ideas that make the modern world what it is. And that kind of mathematics was uh, built on an intuition, an intuition that Laplace formulated as this. He said, you ought then to regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past state and the cause, as the cause of the one which is to follow. Given for one instant an intelligence which could comprehend all the forces by which nature is animated and the respective situation of beings who compose it, an intelligence sufficiently vast to submit those data to analysis, it would embrace the same formula, the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the lightest atom. For it, nothing would be uncertain in the future and the past would be present to, to its eyes. So, Laplace is essentially saying, if we only have enough data and enough computing power, intelligence, to analyze them, we will know everything there is to know about the universe. And that is the fundamental idea of prediction, of data-driven prediction that underpins all of the artificial intelligence and machine learning that is shaping the modern world. And it, too, goes back to the stars. But let me finish with a coda, because, of course, the... Um, destiny of Babbage was cruel, and even more so, in a sense, because you know, we now know something that he didn't know, although he suspected it. In the, at the 200th anniversary of Babbage's birth, the London Science Museum uh, got together a team of experts, and they dug out all of the uh, plans that Babbage had drawn up for the difference engine, the one that he never finished. And they used only technology that was, would have been available at the time of Babbage's. And they put together an engine exactly like he had designed it. And when they crank the handle, it worked exactly as intended. Babbage was right, only he didn't manage to build his computer that was born among the stars. Which brings us to the present day, and to the fact that, sadly, we are no longer all that much looking up. And the paradox 
of the present day is this, that while we have access to the most amazing imagery about the deep sky universe, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope picture, the James Webb Space Telescope picture, now the Euclid Space Telescope, all of these fantastic images of the universe are available to us, you know, just by flicking our finger, well, we no longer know where any of these things are in the sky because we don't look up. And when we do, we see hardly anything in the, in the orange glow that is completely covering our cities. We are lost, we are, losing, we are losing very, very quickly our primordial connection to the night sky. And I'm here to tell you that this matters. And it's not just you know, a matter of being romantic about it, although there is that too, let me be honest about it. You know, it's the perpetual experience of the sublime, as Emerson put it. But it's also you know, a question of uh, understanding how deeply seated the influence of the stars has been in our past and how important they can still be for our future. And light pollution is encroaching upon us. 50% of the world population lives in, in, in cities nowadays where the stars are hardly to be seen. Uh, light pollution is increasing at the rate of 6% a year. And apart from you know, disconnecting us from the stars, it is in, in and for itself an environmental problem because it changes the habits of birds, bats, insects. It changes the life cycle of plants, trees, and, uh, and, and, uh, and flowers. And therefore, it changes the balance of the entire ecosystems without us really noticing it. And if you, know, if you look around at the map of uh, the light pollution in, in, in Europe, it's very, very hard now to find a dark enough spot to go there and just look up and perhaps see the wonder of the Milky Way streaking the sky at night and it, it go back to those uh, primordial times when all of those stars were so important. It's astonishing to think that in the mid of the 19th century, the Milky Way was still visible from London. You know, one of the greatest, biggest cities in Europe at the time, you could still just look up at night and see the Milky Way before artificial lighting and gas lighting was, was introduced. But today, there's another danger that uh, is uh, uh, menacing the night sky. And the danger that we are bringing, uh, again, upon ourselves, the danger of uh, filling up space with artificial satellites. This idea that you know, by sending thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit, we are going to create, some people are going already to create, mega constellations of internet satellites. Now, to put this into perspective, since 1957, when the Sputnik was first launched uh, into orbit, the first artificial satellite ever, we sent about, until recently, 4,000 satellites to orbit. But now, in the last three or four years, we sent another 6,000. And by 2030, it's, it's expected that we, there will be up to 100,000 artificial satellites in orbit. Most of them are in low Earth orbit, between 250 and 450 kilometers of altitude, which means that particularly when they're being deployed, they reflect the light of the sun and they shine like artificial stars. And while they might be excited to see a string of, in this case, Starlink satellites being deployed once, this also means that wherever you go on planet Earth soon, you won't be able to see the stars anymore because they will be outnumbered by artificial satellites. In, by 2030, wherever you look with a binocular, there will be eight or ten artificial satellites going through and they will be completely destroying our possibility to ever see the stars, ever see the starry canopy as our ancestors ever did uh, from prehistory to today. And why are we doing this? Because of internet connection, to connect the world. Except, you know, there are other ways of doing this, because you could send fewer satellites to a higher orbit. But of course, if the satellites are higher up, that means that the time for the signals to go back and forth is longer, longer latency. So your internet is a little bit slower. And who really needs a very fast and very responsive internet? Who is the customer base this is built for? Bankers, because they can do uh, high, high frequency trading very, very fast. And gamers, because of course, if you're playing a video game, you don't want to be shot down uh, if, you're, if the satellites are too high up. But what, is, what are we giving up in return? We're giving up the last global common. You know, the one thing that really unites us all, the starry sky above us. And not only that, it's also a professional danger for 
people like myself. You know, when you take long time exposures of the night sky, those satellites passing by leave streaks that damage up to 50% of the data that astronomers are trying to collect about the universe, and therefore this is a real threat to our ability to do the best cutting-edge science and try to understand the building blocks of the universe, but also to detect, for example, uh, dangerous asteroids in, co in collision course with, with Earth. The uh, signals coming down from those satellites also uh, uh, are radio signals, and they, when they pass above radio telescopes, which are designed to pick up the faint whisper of distant radio galaxies, those signals are so strong that they will fry the receiver, and so they destroy telescopes that are worth billions of dollars, and, and radio astronomers are desperate to, to avoid that. And so all of this, you know, maybe is saying that what we should do is, well, just leave the planet behind, and just go above those satellites and uh, take the next step, as some people say, into, uh, into our exploration of the universe and go to, uh, not just to the moon, but really colonize other planets. Mars might be the next target and just, you know, colonize the stars. Now, I think that space exploration is hugely important, has been hugely uh, inspirational, and it will be more so now that the Artemis mission is set to return to the moon, uh, taking the first woman, the first person of color to the moon. Those are great achievements that can be very, very inspirational in terms of science, technology, but also uh, in terms of uh, uh, highlighting our fundamental uh, capability as a species to overcome incredible uh, difficulties and incredible problems. What I, I don't agree is this idea that some of the very same space barons that are putting the satellites up are also trying to sell us. This idea that the next step for us is just to go to another planet. Because, you know, let's face it, those people say, if the Earth is a compromised planet in the face of climate change, in the face of the terrible wars and conflicts that we are witnessing in our age, in the face perhaps of runaway artificial intelligence that might one day destroy humankind, well, if all of that threatens us, we don't need to do too much about it. Just go to another planet, you know, and, uh, and leave the Earth behind. Well, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think that's a good idea because there is no planet B. We make our stand on this planet. That's where our life has always will be and will always be because really, colonizing mass, or even more, going to the stars. It's a technology pipe dream. It's not going to happen. We don't have the means to do that. And, you know, even sending a few people to Mars would be a fantastic achievement, but that's not the same as sending humankind to Mars. And it's a dangerous distraction. It's a red herring. The fact that we can ever hope to leave our beautiful blue spaceship behind and just camper off to another planet, that's not going to happen. And it's a distraction with respect to the urgent ecological, environmental, uh, social problems that we have to face on this planet. It's here that Homo sapiens was born, and it's here that Homo sapiens will make our, hopefully not last, stand. But there is another way in which I think the stars can be inspiring. And not by inspiring us to go there, you know, they would take tens of thousands of years to get to the nearest stars, so that's not feasible. But rather by highlighting a cosmic perspective. And there is something called the overview effect. The idea that, that many astronauts who have been not just to uh, Earth orbit, but also all the way to the moon and back, those people, you know, astronauts who have been selected especially as military test pilots for their cold-headedness, their stern psychology, and their ability to be rational in all circumstances, some of them, many of them, have reported a great sense of almost uh, a spiritual awakening when seeing planet Earth from 300,000 kilometers away, when seeing the fundamental unity of our blue, uh, uh, of our blue planet and the fact that we are so unique and so special in the cosmos. Now, don't get me wrong, I think life is out there somewhere in, in, in the galaxy. It, it, the, the thing is, we are just not ever going to be able to, to, to get to them. So we are not alone in the universe, but we are alone in our corner of the universe. And to see Earth like this from space really dri drives home the idea that Earth is a very, very special place and that we are not doing enough to be able to take good care of it. 
and therefore I think the overview effect, looking up to the stars, not all of us will be able to go to the moon, I don't think, but that, that same kind of um, feeling, the same kind of awareness can be had if we just seek out the dark skies, if we just go out and look up at the stars and remember all the stories that have shaped human civilization, all the ways in which the stars have led us, you know, not just technology and science, but also spirituality, religion, um, art, and all of it. And all of this has been always part of our inheritance, our cosmic inheritance, and we are part of the lineage. And by looking up at the stars, perhaps, just perhaps, we can rekindle and find again that spirit, and that will tell us about how to take the next step in a way uh, that will be uh, good, not just for us, but for the whole planet. In 1978, then, when the two Voyager spacecrafts were sent to a mission to Jupiter and Saturn, it was realized by Carl Sagan that after the mission was concluded, they would get lost into interstellar space, eventually leaving the solar system. And indeed, uh, both the Voyagers have left the solar system a few years back and are now traveling towards uh, uh, a star that they will reach in about 40,000 years. Now, the Voyagers still send back uh, regular blip bips, but uh, that mission is now over, except for one late addition to that mission. This golden record. The idea by astronomer and science communicator Carl Sagan to place a golden disk aboard the Voyagers. And this disk on the cover that you see here has got um, instructions for how to play it, essentially like an LP record of olden days. How to play it? It's got the location of the Earth at the center of that radial pattern. This is the distance uh, to uh, uh, 14 of the nearest pulsars in order to give to any alien that might one day find this disk an, an idea of where we, where we came from. And it's sprayed with a veil of radioactive uranium with a half-life of 4.5 billion years, a kind of a countdown clock. So if anybody finds it in the distant future, they will know when and where it was sent. And if anybody ever finds those probes and picks up the golden record and gets it to work, sounds and images from 1970s Earth will come back to life. And there is songs, there is speeches, there is images, there is noises, there is sounds of nature. And the idea was to give these imaginary aliens an opportunity to learn about us. And I find it really moving in a way, this idea of sending a spacecraft the size of a small car to the stars and putting on that spacecraft a message in a bottle, a message that will tell to anybody that might or might not find it in the future, against all hope, against all reason, that we have existed, that humans were there, that we were starborn, and to the stars we leave our memory. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>